Oh, I'm just. So today we're going to talk about the Torah portion Shalach. Shalach. It's one of the most puzzling stories, one of the most really puzzling, puzzling stories in the Torah. Well, there's so many puzzling stories because here the Jewish people have received the Torah and literally saw every miracle possible. And now they're getting ready to enter into the land of Israel and something very, very troubling happens. They're getting ready to conquer the land of Israel and something very troubling happens. So you know the story with the Knesset. The Good morning, good morning, Jane. The Israeli government has a meeting. How can we improve the economy in Israel? So one of the fellows says, very simple, let's wage a war against the United States of America. They'll demolish us, they'll destroy us. And then they'll send us money to rebuild. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the, uh, another member of Knesset says, but I have a very important question. What happens if we win? Who's going to help us rebuild? <laughs> so the Jews are poised to going into the land of Israel. And a very interesting conversation happens between Moshe and God. And I'm going to read you the conversation. And of course, everything begins with women, right? <laughs> so this is what happens. Vayedaber Hashem al Moshe, and God speaks to Moshe, Lamar saying, "Shalach lecha anashim, send for yourself men, and have them scout the land of Canaan." So spies, Miragla means spies. Okay. So Rashi jumps in. And right away, ask the question, what does it mean send for you? That's not right English. S send spies. Why for you? And the answer is, Rashi says, because God says to Moshe, I didn't tell you to send spies. You want to send spies, you take responsibility. It's lechot, it's for you. You want it. And then there's another beautiful interpreter. Good morning, Dory from Clay Yakar that says, God says, Shalach lecha nashim. You want to send for you sp uh, men, spies, send women better. I don't think it's a good idea, God says to Moshe, to send men. If you want it, because remember the idea generated from the Jewish people, they wanted to send spies to check out how to conquer the land. So God says, Moshe, you're already sending spies, make sure it's women. Because women will come back with an accurate report about what's going on. <laughs> you send the fellows, you're going to see what happens, and soon we'll see what happens. And remember, Clay Yucker is not living in our 21st century of feminism and liberalism and, 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 and what we call universal equality. This is years and years and years ago, which, always, which underlines again what I always like to say, that the Torah recognizes the, the superior, superiority and equality of men and women in the universe, in the world, as it's meant to be. That always in the Torah, we recognize the fact that women are the foundation of the world and definitely superior, but if you don't want to take that approach, equal. Equal but different. So God says to Maisha, Okay, you like you want to send spies, Anoshim. Why does he say? Because Moshe wants to send not Anoshim men, and God says, No, better send Noshim. <laughs> he says, and women, it'll be a, a better outcome. But Lecha means for you, you're doing it for you. I don't need you to send spies. So Moshe chooses the cream of the crop, 12, one from every tribe. Amongst them, Kalev Ben Yefuna and Yoshua ben Nun, Joshua and Kalev. Why am I mentioning Joshua and Kalev? Because Joshua will become the next Jewish leader who conquers the land of Israel with the Jewish people, as we'll soon read in the coming portions how Moshe does not go into the land of Israel. He dies, he passes away in the desert. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Yeshua and Kalev ben Yefun are among the 12 spies. Now let's see what happens. Let's tell the story and let's analyze what happens here. 
And also we're going to analyze another time, 40 years later, when the Jewish people sent spies again mm -hmm. to conquer the land with Joshua now as the leader. And what happens then? We'll draw a parallel. Hopefully we'll have time. So let's read a little bit because it's always beautiful to see what the Pasuk says. Okay, so the 12 leaders of the tribes, again, he's not sending rabble rousers. You know, many times you watch these movies where they send criminals to do suicide missions into foreign territory because they're dispensable. So they take a browdy group of troublemakers and they send them in. You be the spies, you be the suicide team that goes in. Moshe is sending the cream of the crap, the leaders in every tribe to go. These are not like ordinary people. These are, and you'll see why it's so important that we know this fact. And that's why it says Anoshim to highlight that they were heads of their tribes, not just anybody, heads of the tribe. Who was he sending? Not Nosh, Anoshim. Why does it have to say Anoshim? Again, to show that these were heads of the tribes. And Klayakar derives what I said before. That says Anoshim to show that God said, Really, you should send women, but I see you're sending men, but okay. So what happens? So they go. And they come back 40 days later with a report about the land of Israel. And what do they say? Okay. So they come back and they brought word back to them and to the entire congregation. And they showed them the fruit of the land and they recounted to him. And they said, we came into the land which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey. And this is the fruit. So first they're saying the positive, look at these giant grapes. Look at, it's a land of milk and honey, but, but however, <laughs> The nation is mighty, those who inhabit the land and the cities are greatly fortified. And we also saw the giants over there, they say. We are not able to go up against the nation for they are more powerful than we. And they spread slander amongst the land about the land. So what did the Jewish people say? Wait, one more very important point they say. And it's a land which consumes its inhabitants and every one of the people we saw in it are giants. And we were like grasshoppers in their eyes. The entire community arose and they wept. And they rallied against Moshe and Aaron and they said, we should have died in the land of Egypt. Why did you have to bring us here to fall by the sword of our wives and our infants and so on? This is what happens, a terrible tragedy. The Jewish people fall to depression and crying and weeping and Moshe, and Aaron are, of course, distraught. And God says, I'm going to destroy them. I'm going to destroy them. They can't inherit the land. I'm going to destroy them. So Moshe says, no, 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 no. What are the Egyptians going to say? They're going to say, God, you know what? The reason you're not bringing the Jews into the land is because you can't. If you do that, what is, what is the nations of the world going to say? You couldn't do it. So please don't harm the Jewish people. So God says, okay, you know what? They're gonna wander now in the desert for 40 years. This generation will die out and the next generation of men and children and women will inherit the land. And that's what happens. They wander for another 40 years. All the men who were 20 years old at the time, by the time they came to enter the land of Israel had died out this generation and the men, the women, the new men, the men and the, and the women and children will go and they inherit the land. Now, this is a very, very, has a very many questions, the story of the Miraglam. 
Like we said before, these were not rabble rousers, troublemakers. You know, and how could they come back and dishearten the entire nation? They literally like pulled the rug out from under the feet of the Jewish people by telling them, listen, it's a land of milk and honey, but they're giants. We cannot conquer the land. And secondly, what do you mean they can't conquer the land? How could they even question it? What just happened over and over again? Everybody here answer. The 10 plagues, the splitting of the Red Sea, the tour at Sinai, God fighting all the wars for them, the manna from heaven, the Miriam's well, miracle after miracle, greatness after greatness. How could they say God can conquer the land? Isn't that a little ridiculous? <laughs> Really? <laughs> God can conquer the land? That's why they're weeping? So all these, doesn't, the response doesn't fit. Doesn't fit. How could they say God can't conquer the land? It's almost ridiculous. Does anybody have any other questions that they could bring up about what's happening here? Well, Go ahead. And I can't take credit for it. I learned it. Oh, no, please, please. That the, our, uh, we had the slave mentality. We weren't going to be able to go forth and build a nation with that mentality. It had to die out and become the next generation and to, to, yep. to go forth. They were, they were afraid. Very good. They were afraid. But, and, and one more very important question that I left out. Why is God angry at the Miraculum for telling the truth? They didn't lie. They didn't come back and make up Bubba Mises that there's nuclear reactors there and nuclear weapons when there aren't. They said they're giants. It's and it's going to be very difficult to conquer. They didn't say, oh, they didn't make up a Bubba Mises like we say. <laughs> they told the truth. So can you condemn them for telling the truth? It was their truth, the way they perceived it from their mental state, I guess. Very good, very good, exactly. They, they had relied upon God all this whole way through and never took it upon themselves to now take the reins and go forward. They so could want God to do it. God to do it. But if God should do it, then, then why are they saying, we can't conquer the land, it's all over for us? Oh, Jane, what did you want to say? Well, this, why would they have to kill another society? Wouldn't they have wanted to do it another way so that they wouldn't have to have more killing? It just, you know. That's that, asking now another question. Yeah, yeah. Then, you know, it's like we can't conquer them, but. Like, you know, it was promised, well, were, the Jews, were we supposed to go in and kill again? I mean, that, or integrate and conquer that way and, and educate or um, somehow manipulate instead of killing. I don't, I don't know, it just, it sounds like there, there was like a, um, there was set up for, for war and killing. Like, why? Well, first of all, let me tell you two things, two very important things. I don't know if we have so much time to analyze what's going on, but if you recall, let's go back. Always history tells the story. When they left Egypt, remember, they asked permission from many nations of the world to pass through their land. So some nations were very hospitable. You know, you don't pass through someone's country with a million people without asking permission. You come to the border, you go, listen, we just left Egypt. You know, it was a little trying. Can we go through? <laughs> the nation of the world gave them food, gave them water. Remember what happened with Moab and Amnon? They refused to give them food and water. And that's why God made a rule. You may never marry a Moabite man because of the cruelty they exhibited. Then when it came, Amalek attacked them. Amalek attacked the whole nation. After seeing what happened to Egypt, Amalek had this tremendous audacity and chutzpah to attack a nation that didn't do anything to them. Right. Right. And 
said now we have to wipe them out. And because they didn't totally wipe out the whole nation of Amalek, as God instructed, Haman descended from that last person, the king that they allowed to live. And look what happens generations later. Because God said, you need to wipe them out. So now when they're about to conquer the land, actually, what happens is when the nation saw that God is bringing the Jewish people into the land of Israel, let's look at it from their side, they cowered in fear. The Jewish people didn't know this. They were cowering in fear, knowing what happened to the Egyptians and the other nations that dare go against the Jewish people. So the Jewish people were willing to enter the land of Israel, their inheritance in a peaceful way. Rather, the wars that were waged was because they were attacked. So we have to get perspective because I think that this uh, approach has to be, is, is transfers now also now, because look what happened. Gaza shot thousands of rockets into Israel. And when we defended ourselves, people said, what? What, what, what? Look, hundreds of Gazan died and only a few Israelis. So does that mean we shouldn't have defended ourselves? We should have rather sat and allowed a thousand Israelis to the Jews to die be so that we shouldn't look bad? We were attacked. So no. enter the land of Israel in the Torah. They were attacked first. And they, God said, fight back. They didn't want to fight. They had to fight. They were attacked. The land belonged to them. God said, now I'm bringing you back to home. You come to your home, it was, there's a house invasion. And the people in the house invasion attack you, should you not defend yourself? They were given a chance to make peace. They didn't want peace. That was the problem. So many documentations where the Jews said, you know what, let's make peace. Let's, let us come in and, and, and inherit our land. And they didn't want the nations of the world. And those that did lived peacefully with the Jews, as we see. And you know what, if you want, I could next week bring, there's a few like documentation that gives you the history of the, of the approach of the Jewish people was always approach of peace first to our own detriment, to our own detriment. But do you think the nations that lived in Israel were going to give up the land of Israel peacefully? Absolutely not. Everything in their power not to let the Jewish people come to their homeland that God gave them. So Jane, did I kind of answer a little bit of the question? Yeah, and of course, um, you know, we, our people, we don't go and attack, but it, I'm just thinking like those, the other people were living there and they didn't really know what was going on. So, you know, or did they? I, I don't, I, you know. You know uh, they did know, they did know, they did know. They did know what was going on. The whole world knew what happened. You know, news traveled oh. that fast. But that's what the whole thing is. And we'll soon read the story of Rachav, which is the second story of the second group of spies. And she tells the spies, we were trembling, hearing that you're coming. Okay. We're all petrified. The kings are all petrified, knowing you're coming. Yeah, we're I just didn't understand what was happening on their ends. Yeah. yeah. The Torah reveals what happens on the other side. Okay. Like if you, if you fast forward, like the story with King David, how the Philistines terrorized the people of Israel for weeks and months and months and months. And the Jewish people didn't even have an army, so to speak, compared to the Philistine army, the Pelishtim, Goliath. Remember the story of David and Goliath. Mm -hmm. So if you go through history, you'll see the, 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 the attacks come always from the nations of the world attacking the Jewish people. You don't think they wanted to enter the land peacefully? Of course they did. Who wants to go to war? Right, right. They were forced to go to war, but war was through the hand of Hashem. God said, go fight the war. Go conquer the land. And we also have to think about the spiritual energy that when the Jewish people are told to conquer a land and defeat an enemy, it is a spiritual enemy they're also fighting. When they conquered Amalek, when they fought against Amalek, Amalek it, it represents disenchantment from godliness, coldness, distance from our spiritual destiny and energy. 
So every one of us has an Amalek that we have to conquer. Where we live in a time in our lives, I'm only bringing this up because you brought up the concept of combat. We have to fight the, uh, the, the enemy within or sometimes the enemy without, but not a physical war, more of a spiritual war against the fact that there's a God, there's a creator, there's laws, there's morality, there's ethics. We're, America's fighting this war as we speak. We think that the fight about Israel and Gaza is only about the weapons. It's not only about the weapons. The fight is about basic human values, life. It's not only a fight about who has more weapons. It's a fight about, we believe that if you're a Jew, you need to be eradicated from the world. You have no right to live. And the Jewish people feel everyone has a right to live. It says so in the Torah. So it's not a fight only about territory. It's a fight of the destiny of the world, the foundation of the universe. Do you value life or don't you value life? So we have to look, dig deeper. It's never only about one gun shooting the other gun, one person shooting the other person. There's always the principles behind it. If you have a book that says that a Jew does not have a right to exist in this universe, do you think any, any, anything can change that? If your fundamental principle is you do not have a right to live in this world, you have to go back to that. No gun, no weapon will, will be able to counteract that because no matter what we do, they always have the book that says we have no right to live on this earth as Jews. So you have to go back to what is the fund, fund, their fundamental reasoning of why they're doing this. Whereas the Torah says, every life is precious. Save one life, save the world. Look at the different approaches. So there you always have to go back to the source. So going back when God tells the Jewish people to conquer the land of Israel, of course they wanted to do it peacefully, but do you think the nations that lived there want to let the Jews in? Anti-Jews didn't start in America now. Anti-Jews started when they left Egypt. <laughs> when Moses says to Paro, let my people go to serve God. No, there is no such a God. That argument started then. <laughs> the argument didn't start now. It's an argument of, the, of that the world keeps fighting. There is a God, there's no God. There is a creator, there's no creator. There are morals and ethics? No, there aren't morals and ethics. So the fight is a fight that started at the beginning of time when God created the world. It is the fight between the negative energy, the positive energy, the godly energy, those that oppose that energy. It's the fight of the world. And it's the fight we battle within ourselves also. So you have to, this is a basis, basic understanding of how the universe world works. You know, a little bit, of, does anybody want to add anything? So uh, Jewish people have never been a nation of warriors, by the way. <laughs> That's not been our, our curriculum vitae or uh, how, what's that French word for our persona? That's never been us, you know? There's a story, you know, in the time of the, uh, I forgot where, in, the, in Russia, they used to grab Jewish boys, put them into the army, and they never saw their families again. So one shtetl heard that they were coming to collect Jewish boys. So a group of elderly men ran and hid in the attic from these uh, cells, from the Russian soldiers. So they come, they find them carrying the corny and they're like, why are you hiding? We don't need elderly men. We need young boys. They go, you're not looking for generals? <laughs> <laughs> generals you don't need? <laughs> the Jews have never been fighters. That's not our, 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 our you know, like they say, you know, that uh, give a Jewish man a hammer, give a Jewish man a screwdriver. He doesn't know what to do with it. <laughs> So we've never been fighters. That's not our persona. That's not what we were raised up to be. We're fighters of truth, warriors of peace, but not people who put on uniforms, you know, unless we have to. Israel has to defend itself. Jews have to defend themselves. Okay. So, so now let's, so we were asking the questions, let's to rehash. First of all, remember who are the Miraglim, the cream of the crop, the leaders. Two, 
Why are they being, why is the Jewish people being punished? They're told the truth. Why are the Miraglim upon it punished? Three, um, what was the third question? Let me just quickly go to my notes. Um, So now, um, I think those are the questions I had. I'm sure there's more. Okay. So let's address, first of all, the, begin the beginning. They were, the Jewish people, were, the Miraglam and the Jewish people were not condemned because they told the truth about the land. That wasn't the problem. They were allowed to say, you know what? There's giants. There's giant fruit. It's difficult to conquer the land. We know that. It's difficult to conquer a land if you don't have... God on your side. If they did not have God performing miracles for them every single day, then that is the truth. So their condemnation, when God says to Moshe, I'm going to destroy the people, it's not because they told the truth. It's not even because they sent spies. It's because they disillusioned the entire nation and they created their reality. When you say you can't, you won't. When you say, I can't, you can't. That's what happens. They changed their destiny. No one can tell you you can do something when in your mind, psychologically, emotionally, mentally, you tell yourself, I can't. I cannot run this race. I cannot climb this mountain. I cannot over obstacle. If a man or woman tells themselves they can't, they can't. They did a study in Israel. They took three groups of people, randomly, and they created three groups. Three groups of superb athletes. One group was superb athletes, randomly chosen. Second group was mediocre athletes, randomly chosen. And the third group was called the low-functioning athletes. Now, in each group, there were some superb athletes, some mediocre, some low. They haphazardly mixed up all the athletes. And for six months, they told the coaches, you're going to train. The first coach, they go, your group are the most outstanding athletes, the cream of the crop. The second coach, they said, these athletes, they need work. They're average, work them up. And the third coach, they said, no, these athletes are from the lowest. They're not, they're not. They're not exactly the most uh, able-bodied group of athletes. They need a lot of work. And they came back after two months and exactly what they said happened. The group of athletes that were told they were superb were indeed were superb. The mediocre remained mediocre. And the lowest group will remain the lowest, uh, lowest uh, group of athletes. How do you call it? Lowest... Right. <laughs> The lowest rung. Of yes, of athletes. In other words, by preconceived notions of what you can accomplish and you cannot ac accomplish is, in a sense, what will happen. If you tell a child you can never succeed, you're not born with brains, you'll never be a star, you'll never be great, I'm, not, I'm stupid, your grandmother was stupid, and you're also stupid. That's who we are. <laughs> brains don't run in the family. Or you tell Max, your father couldn't throw a ball, your grandfather couldn't throw a ball, even your great grandfather couldn't throw a ball. You will never be a professional athlete. Better become a doctor or a lawyer. <laughs> how we determine our destiny, in a sense, is how we view ourselves. We say we can't, we can't. You can't, you won't. So, this is what happened. It's not that they didn't tell the truth. They came back and said, we can't conquer the land. We can't conquer the land. There's no weak way we could do it. Instead of saying, you know what? It's a tough situation, but guess what? God is in our back pocket here. We have the general of all generals. <laughs> we have the <laughs> X-Men. We have whatever those guys are called, <laughs> supermen. In other words, all the miracles they saw, all the revelations of godliness they saw, it didn't integrate into their psyche. 
They lacked faith. And that was the problem. The problem, God is not vindictive. Oh, okay, you spoke bad about my land. Now good for you, I'm gonna make you wander 40 years. Now I'm gonna get back at you. God is saying you created your destiny. You said you can't conquer, you can't because you don't know matter what I do. All the months and months, remember this is a one and a half years later and they saw all the miracles and to this moment they couldn't, the faith, the belief in God did not become part of their psyche. They did not integrate, internalize the concept of faith. This is what happened. They did not internalize the fact that there are challenges in life. There are hurdles. There are barriers. But guess what? There's something called faith. There's a God. And that's what the problem here was, the underlying problem. And they demoralized the Jewish people and tapped into the insecurities of the people. And then the people cried and wailed. And that's why they were punished. They created their own. God said, okay, you can't, you won't. You're gonna wander 40 years because your mindset is one, I cannot do it. I can't, That's you can't and you won't and they didn't. This generation who cried, the men died out in the desert and didn't enter the land. It was the next generation and the women and the, and the kids. You know why the women goes back to shalach l'cha anashim. The women didn't lose faith. The women were not part of the crying criers. They said, God said he's taking us to our homes. We're going to our homes. So again, the faith of the women rise up in every instance. Now, don't think it was so wonderful because imagine all these women entered the land of, uh, of Israel without their spouses, without the men, without the grandfathers, without many of their children, with their sons, because the generation died out. So it wasn't exactly like they were riding high here. So it was a very painful situation here. Now let's dig even deeper. What subconsciously, we just said these were the cream of the crop. How could they like, and the answer is because they feared victory. You know, some people, what the famous said, there's nothing to fear but fear itself. The Miraglim feared the 10. Remember, two were not included in the group. Feared victory. Sometimes we fear success because we fear failure, so we fear success. They feared victory. You know why? Think about what's going on. They're living in the desert. God hovers on a cloud, a pillar of fire at night, the well of Miriam, mana from heaven. Their clothes are washed without washing machines. They don't need jobs. They don't have to earn a living. They don't have to pay tuition. They don't have to apply for FAFSA for college. They don't have to... <laughs> They don't have to worry about transportation. They don't have to worry about investments. And will my investments go up? Should I buy Bitcoin? Should I not buy Bitcoin? Should I invest in ETAs and EFTs? Should I liquidate now or wait for the next crash? Who knows what? They had a life of Riley. You know, like after vacation, the, you know, the biggest problem with vacation is coming home. <laughs> you have to come home. If you didn't have to come home, it would be a machaya. <laughs> you have to vacation from the vacation. And all the problems are right there where you left them after your little vacation. <laughs> so they didn't want to enter the land subconsciously. They said there are giants. We can't conquer. But that wasn't the problem. They knew God could conquer the land like this. They feared going into a land where now they're going to have to buy property. They're going to have to settle. They're going to have to make schools. They're going to have to set up government. They're going to have to elect officials. They feared the change in life where God wouldn't sit and give them a cloud by day and a pillar of fire at night. They feared, they feared that their spiritual connection would dissipate. Now I'm gonna have to plow my field, pick my fruits, enroll my kids, and so on and so forth. They feared the real world. And so they self-sabotaged. They self-sabotaged. 
themselves, whether consciously but subconsciously, Hasidus explains, they self-sabotaged. We cannot conquer the land. What they were really saying is, we don't want to have conquer the land. We like it here in God's warm cocoon. Why give that up? And even on a deeper level, Chassidus Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism explains, is once we go into the land and we're entrenched in the physical materialistic world, how will we keep that strong godly bond? When we're so entrenched in materialistic pursuits, we're going to need money. We're going to need have. We're going to with money comes dispute. With, with dispute comes arguments. With it, you know, life happens. We're going to be in the physical world, and we're going to be disconnected from this tremendous godly light, studying and learning and speaking to God directly, like we are doing in the desert. How will we integrate? Spiritual and physical will be lost in the materialistic physical world, and we will have to give up our spiritual connection. That was their biggest fear in conquering the land. Excuse me. So here you see there's multi layers to what goes on here. It's not always oh, just, oh, yeah, let's talk evil about the land. It's interesting, Ilya Wiesel was giving a talk. I, I mentioned once my, when my father passed away, we started something called uh, the Gershon Jacobson uh, Memorial Lectures every year on his, on his yard site. Instead of making a party, we made a lecture because my father was an intellectual. He was a writer. He was a journalist. He pursued knowledge. So Ellie Wiesel was his best, best friend. So he was the first speaker. And he said something that I always remember. He said, Lush and Hara is not only about people, talking bad about people, even if it's true. You know, Lush and Hara could be true. The person is a thief, but you shouldn't point it out. She did tell a lie, but don't point it out. Lush and Hara, you're not allowed to talk Lush and Hara on the land of Israel. Because it's not just a land, it's a land that has a soul. It's a land that's alive, he says. Never talk bad about your, the land of Israel, he said. Like when there was the Six Day War, they asked him, say something. He says, no, I cannot talk only good when my land is at war. Don't talk Lashon Hara, not even on your own land, on your own Anarit Israel, because it's a land with a soul. So they spoke bad about the land of Israel. You're not allowed to do that. You can't talk bad about your land. It's terrible. It's a bureaucracy. I can never live there. Look how they're torturing the Arabs, Nebuch. They didn't give them immunity, the vaccine when it came out. Did you know that they rejected it because they didn't want Israel to look good? Do you know that? How many they offered? Thousands of vaccines and they rejected it? Another conversation, another time. So they were scared of success. They were scared of victory. And they self-fulfilled prophecy. Sometimes, you know, you don't want to be happy. You're scared of being happy. One guy was told, my uh, brother's a rabbi. So he says, Rabbi, I'm afraid of being happy. Why? Because if I'm happy, God will punish me. He'll say, you? You don't deserve to be happy. Boom. So I always make myself miserable, he says. <laughs> And he meant it. He meant it. When you tell yourself you can't, you won't. I can't do this. I know I'll never be able to do this. And you won't do it. Because in your mind, you can't. And the mental, uh, the, how we view ourselves is very important, which brings me now to that famous line. They write, they were giants and we were like grasshoppers. Lubavitcher Rebbe says something so powerful. Why? They had an inferior complex. Because they vo viewed themselves like gas grasshoppers. That was the problem. <laughs> Sometimes you meet people who go, me, I'm like a nothing. Look at her, dressed in the latest fashion, has a beautiful home, beautiful husband, beautiful children, beautiful car. Me, I'm like a grasshopper. I'm a nobody. Everybody looks down at me. Really, nobody's looking down at you. 
you're viewing yourself in a very poor way. So you think everyone views you like is that. <laughs> they were giants, but we were like grasshoppers, the Miraglam said. Because they viewed themselves with such low self-esteem. They couldn't conquer the land. Yes, Diane, good, what do you want to say? So should they have really been punished? Is it really their fault that they felt that way because they, we were slaves? How could you feel good when you were enslaved for years and years and years? It's true, but remember, remember, this is not a week after leaving Egypt. I'll tell you how many days exactly I wrote it down. It's over a year and how many months? Hold on. I wrote it down because you know me with numbers. I'm terrible. So I always write down my numbers. Over a year. Over a year. But not only a year, Diane and every... A year. Ten, remember, I, we discussed this. Why did it have to be ten plagues? One plague wasn't enough? Did God enjoy punishing the Egyptians? Every plague tapped into another part of nature so that the slave mentality... The psyche, the psychological, emotional slave mentality has to be pulled out. So when they saw that God encompasses every iota of nature, slowly but surely there, there was a transformation from slave to freedom, from slave mentality. We're talking about Jews that saw what well, they say, what a maid servant saw at the splitting of the Reed Sea, a maid servant of no great prophet ever saw in their lives. In other words, what the simplest person saw at the exit of Egypt, the greatest uh, leaders of uh, sages and prophets never saw. So this had to have to be a transformation, step by step, developing a relationship with God, developing the faith in God. You know, you see it all the time with like adopted child. They think no one can love them. So you have to kind of wait, chip away, love, 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 until the adopted child begins to feel love and knows that he or she's not gonna be given a patch or a slap when they drop a cup or something. So it's a development of undoing the negative behavior, changing it to positive behavior. The Jewish people, God started to instill in them a relationship slowly but surely mana from heaven water from a well the revelation at sinai the teachings the pillar of fire at night the cloud by day the answers to the questions and so what was your i'm sorry what was your brother's um advice to the person that that he that said that to him that he that you have it all wrong that's not what God wants from you. Which brings Diane's point, were they punished? Diane, what Hasidus is explaining, and also Carrie, this might answer the question, is that <laughs> it's not that God punished them and the 40 years they died out in the desert. Those group of Jews didn't want to enter the land, couldn't enter the land. Their psyche, their emotional state, their destiny they created for themselves. I can't enter the land. It, it, so what should God have forced them into the land once they created their mindset that we can't do it? They didn't do it. You understand what happened here? It's a very um, it's, it's not an easy concept to uh, understand, but that's what happened. Once you decided you're not going, you're not going, Diane. You're not going to France. So you know what I mean? Now I'll read the story. I'll say why? Why didn't she go to France? Because you decided you don't want to. You understand? They decided they can't, they can't. Sorry, Dory, go ahead, one second. Yeah. I'm, I'm questioning how much of the punishment are we blaming to God when it's really, we punish ourselves? Yeah, exactly. It, you, there are consequences to your actions. You know, like the joke, I hate to use this as a joke, but you know, the guy, there's a flood. So they come with, a, first the police come and say, come, no, 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 God will save me. And then they come with a boat and he says, no, 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 God will save me. And then, you know, by the time he's on the roof, they send the helicopter and he tells the helicopter, no, no, God will save me. And then he, he drowns, he comes up to heaven, 
He says, God, I was such a good Jew. Why didn't you save me? God said, yeah, I did. I sent the police. I sent the boat. <laughs> I sent the helicopter. <laughs> I did try to save you. You refused. <laughs> so it's, it's a silly joke, but it, it underlines that there is an energy that goes on in the world. There are self-fulfilled prophecies that go on in the world. We are... We, that's free choice, it's called. That makes us different from the animal kingdom. We choose. We choose. We choose what happens at times. Of course, there's also, you know, divine providence. It's meant to happen. It had to happen. But we get choices. And there are consequences. If you remember the story with Dina, remember Dina, how she was supposed to marry Esau. And not Dina. Dina's mother, Leah, Leah, was supposed to marry Asaph. She didn't. So what ends up happening? Now Yaakov has to marry Leah and Rachel. Everything changes because one person decided their destiny was not what they wanted. I don't want to marry an Asaph. I want to marry a Jacob. Even though her destiny was to marry Esau, and change him and transform him. So now Yaakov had to assume the destiny of his brother and himself. And the whole chain of events unfolds. We don't only inherit from our parents, by the way, the DNA, the blue eyes, the blonde hair, the, the tendency to gain weight on our hips. <laughs> we also inher inherit their spiritual de destiny, their spiritual energy. Many times what happens to us is a continuation of what was meant to happen with the grandparents and the great-grandparents. What happens to Dina when she's attacked by Shechem is a direct result of what happened didn't happen with her mother. We discussed that whole Kabbalistic, beautiful Hasidic insight. The destiny unfolds itself. That's why we also say in a positive light, you never know what you'll do now, generations later will impact the future generation. Like Sarah and Queen Esther, 120 nations, 124 nations she ruled because Sarah was pure for 124 years. You say, really now, aren't you like, like stretching it thin? But no, that's it. Um, the world, the universe, our lives based on the wisdom of Torah is a continuum. It's not fragmented. What happened in Egypt is not like, oh, no, leave me out of that. I'm living in America. No, it's a continuation. It's one giant chain, one giant string, and you cut it, there's consequences. This is what the Torah is telling us. So about being happy is that God wants us happy. To think that you're going to be struck by lightning because you don't deserve to be happy, you have to analyze why don't you think you deserve to be happy? If do us Hashem besimcha, that's the foundation of Hasid Hasidism, by the way. Serve God with joy. Unlike the other th thoughts, we serve God with you know discipline, judgment. The world was based on compassion and love. Remember the story we discussed with Noah, why the dove brings back the message? Because the world had to be rebuilt on compassion. God does not want a world built on judgment. God wants a world built on compassion and love. So I don't want to use the word they were punished. They created their own future. We don't want to go to London. Okay, you'll wander for 40 years and the next generation will go in. God says, okay, you don't want, you don't want that. Like my Baba would say, Freddy, I say, Baba, I want a cookie. No, you can't have a cookie, but you could have one of my fish latkes. I say, Baba, I don't want a fish latke. That's finished. So don't. <laughs> you don't want, you don't want. I'm not going to cry over it. <laughs> my Baba would say, that's finished. She'd say, you don't want, don't take it. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, growing up with this Yiddishisms was beautiful. Sometimes I blurt it out to my kids and my kids write it down. They want to remember it. So, so my, this is just off on a tangent. Son Yaakov loves my Yiddish expressions. So I say, well, he tells me a story and I'm like, I said, it makes sense like chickpeas on a wall. <laughs> no matter what I did, he said, I said, you know, Yaakov, time to teach me. 
so uh, yeah, he loves he loves using them and telling them to his friends, like you know, giving them a little dick, you know. So um, so they created their own future, their own destiny. Let's see how much time we have to see. We oh, we have ten more minutes. So let me go into something very beautiful. There's no time to discuss the other part of the of the spies. There's only ten minutes, but I want to share something uh, very beautiful. May I or? Yeah, 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 sure. So, uh, so okay. So, what happens is, let's just end the story so we don't. So, again, the punishment was for forty years they they wandered more in the desert, until forty years later. Then Joshua Moshe passes away. Joshua, the new leader, takes over and they conquer and they settle the land of Israel. That's the end of the story. Not in this Torah portion, but as we progress. So, there's a little ending wraps it up. Um, when we discuss Moshe's passing, is very, very touching, very emotional. What happens? Why Moshe doesn't go into the land of Israel? That's another Torah portion. But I want to finish off by saying that Yahushua and Kalev Ben Nun, two out of the ten, do not agree with their counterparts, and they say the following. And this is a beautiful thing. They say the following line. They say. One second, uh, ten, and ah, uh, this is what they say. They get up and they say, They said to the entire nation of Israel, who said it? Yeshua, the son of Nun, and Kalev, the son of Yifuna. Ha'aretz, asher avadita ba laturaisai, taiva ha'aretz ma'oid ma'oid. The land where we, which we have passed to scout it is very good, very, very good. Twice, they say. So now they get up and they counteract the other 10. They go, the land is very, very good. In other words, the other Sen are saying, what happens when we come into the land of Israel? I'm sharing now a Kabbalistic insight, Hasidist Jewish mysticism. We're going to have to give up our godly connection. We're going to have to work the land. We're going to become disconnected from this amazing light and energy of the desert. You guys all forgot why God put us into this world. You forgot why we got the Torah at Sinai. The whole purpose of Torah and mitzvahs is not that we stay in a cocoon, in the bosom of God, in the desert, where everything is given to us and there's no um, energy expedited on our, by, on our, by ourselves. You have to go into the land, into the physical materialistic land and cultivate it and work it and live in it. That's the first taif. I mean, ma'id, very. And then take the other very, imbue that material, physical land, life, world with godliness, spirituality, holiness, Torah, and mitzvahs. Ma'id, ma'id. There is a partnership in this world that now is time for us to create and meld the partnership. The years in the deserts taught us faith, inculcate us with the spirituality and holiness we needed. Now it's time to bring it all together. All the knowledge, all that that we built within ourselves, the strength, the faith, the light, go into the material world, the physical, and imbue that with godliness and spirituality. So Yeshua ben Nun and Kala ben Yifuna say to the people, now it's time to conquer, to take the material and imbue it with the spiritual, the holy and imbue it with the material, with holiness. That's our mission. To stay in the desert is defeating why God put us here. Our whole purpose is to conquer the land, whether it's then or now, conquer our material, physical world, imbue it with godliness, holiness, spirituality, and light. Bring it together. That's the real world. You have to live in the land, but imbue it with godliness and holiness. That's what the Miraglim failed to realize, that the destiny is not to sit in the desert, not to sit in mama and papa's house, and mooch off. <laughs> now you have to go out and make your mark. 
Take the knowledge. We gave you the education. We gave you the money. We gave you the beautiful clothes and the beautiful home and the beautiful foundation. Now you go out and take that and build your home, your land, your family. Expand on that. That is what they were meant to do. And this is what the two leaders, Kalev and Yeshua, knew, and the others didn't, or subconsciously didn't want that, because why give up? Why give up? This has been good sitting with mommy and Tati and <laughs> getting everything and everything we want and not living the real world and accomplishing why you were meant to be here. This is what they failed to realize. And then it is Yahushua who then leads the people into the land of Israel. And that's why when he sends his spies, 40 years later, he succeeds where they don't. Because he told his spies two very important things that will, maybe you know what will continue next week. But I want to just end off with this. So you look and you see what does the Torah portion speak about next? When you come into the land, Chala, the mitzvah of Chala, the mitzvah of Tzitzis, the mitzvah of pouring wine on the altar. Again, indicating what's Tzitzis, you take wool, you wear it, you know, make a bracha. What's Chala, the woman's mitzvah, you take off a piece of dough, you burn it in the time of the Holy Temple, you gave it to the Kayin. What wine? Wine comes from grapes. You take from the wine or grapes, you squeeze it and pour wine on the altar, the altar. Again, indicating what is the three myths? These three myths have to do with conquering the land and the spies. Talking about changing topics here. If you want to be a bestseller, be consistent. You're talking about spies conquering the land. Suddenly, no, don't forget challah. Don't forget tzitzis. Don't forget wine for the altar. Hello, hello. Really, God, can you confuse us anymore? The answer is because God is now alluding to us that you're going into the land to do what? To take the material items, challah dough, wine, wool, and imbuing it with godliness and spirituality. So by tying in the mitzvahs with the conquering of the land, God is telling us, remember what your mission and purpose is on earth, what I just mentioned before. Your mission and purpose is not to stay in the desert. Your mission is to go and cultivate the land, imbue the material, the physical, with spirituality, holiness, and godliness. And that's our mission to this very day. Like we discussed, what, Carrie, what brings a person happiness? Knowing what their role in life is, knowing what is wanted and needed of you. That's what brings you happiness. You can buy, you can buy, you can buy, you can shop and buy, and there'll be an emptiness. You can post on Facebook all your superficial things. But what's going to really buy you love, happiness, joy? The permanent things in your life. Your connection to your soul and to godliness and to light. That's what brings true happiness. If you overpost, there's a problem. You're looking for love and happiness in the wrong place. After you get 900 likes... What's going to be? You need another 900 likes because there's an emptiness that can't be filled. You want to fill the emptiness, you have to go somewhere else. Not social media. You have to find the light and the joy and the happiness in things that matter and are meaningful. And I always start when I'm in a bad mood doing something for someone else. Whenever I'm in a terrible mood, I try to do something for something, someone else. It makes me feel happy because it taps into the soul. So whenever you're feeling unhappy, do something for somebody else. It sounds counterintuitive, because most people say you're unhappy, go to the spa, go buy yourself a new pair of shoes. You'll feel much better, mommy. You'll feel much better, true? No, I'm not saying don't go to the spa. Please go to the spa, get the manicure, pedicure, buy yourself a new outfit and new shoes. I'm all for that. You know that I'm a very big proponent of feminine beauty and, 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 you know, I'm always sending my kids shopping, go shop, but know that that is not the way it also has to be tempered with the spiritual. Before you go shopping, say a prayer that your credit card will not be declined. <laughs> 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 But anyway, 
that's what's going to bring you real happiness. I'll just end over the story that happened to me because I spoke about being happiness. I was in the worst mood you could imagine. I had to be at a meeting. Everything, you know, I put on mascara, it got all over me. It took 20 minutes to wipe off. I put on my shirt, the button popped. Everything to make me late for this meeting. And then this was the clincher. I get in the car, there was no gas and I have to be in front. Oh. Oh, like, oh, I blew a lid, I honked, I banged, I threw everything in the car. You never saw such a crazy lady. I go into the gas station and guess what? The credit card thing doesn't work. So now I'm, you know, could you get worse than oh. that? Are you sticking your credit card? I said, okay, I'm going to be late for the meeting, whatever the heck with it. Excuse me, excuse my language. So I go into the convenience shop of the gas station and I meet someone from Circle of Friends an older woman who lives nearby. And she walked over to the gas station with her walker as she passed her name away, her name was Teddy. And I said to her, Teddy, what are you doing here? She says, Freda, I'm allowed to talk to you because I know you from Circle of Friends. You're Freda. And I said, that's right, I'm Freda. She says, well, I, every day I come walk to the gas station to get myself a coffee and a newspaper, she tells me. And I go, Teddy, that's amazing. So I say to her, Teddy, you know what? I'm buying gas, but can I give you a lift home? So she looks at me and she says, you know, I know you, Freda, from Circle of Friends, so I know I'm allowed to go into your car. She's like, you know. So I put her in the car with the walker. I drive her to her house, 80 County Street. Um, she's already passed away a few years ago. Um, and I bring her into the house. We say goodbye. And when I got into my car, I felt happy. My whole mood, my whole terrible morning was, re was gone. And I'm like, wow, all because of Teddy. And then two years later, she passes away. And I get a call from Star, where she was a member. And I say to them, when is the funeral? They go, oh, she's not having a funeral. Her mother can't afford it. And I'm like, what? No, 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 no. I'm going to pay for this plot and the funeral, my husband will officiate it. I'm going to take care of the whole funeral. Please call her mother. I didn't know who her mother was because she was already an older participant. So they call her mother and her mother hears. She says, no, no, you know what? We're going to do a Jewish funeral. And they make do a Jewish funeral, Baruch Hashem. So I made a memorial in the show. I called up the uh, agency and I made a memorial. And 200 people, including all the circle of friends, came to memorialize Teddy. Yeah. Her name was Tova. And I started a Teddy something, Teddy Memorial Fund that year for her. And her mother wrote me a beautiful letter and her mother sent me a few hundred dollars to start off the fund. And at this memorial that I made in the shul, uh, I told the story of the gas station, how Teddy changed my life. I used to see her on Tuesdays, but I also, that one time I said, you have no idea how I remember that story of Teddy Tova. So just a story how sometimes the most silly things can change your life, but you know why they're not so silly because they tap in to doing a mitzvah. When you do a mitzvah, it, can, it has to change you. So whenever you're having a terrible, no good, awful day, <laughs> <laughs> the mitzvah fell in my lap <laughs> you know it's not like I went to look for it <laughs> but you see I had to go into the convenience store and you know and offering her a lift was like who cares I'm already late who cares another hour it won't make a difference you know I don't even know what happened at that meeting which comes to show you that it didn't matter okay so let's uh, end off does anybody 